I'm going to start this morning a little differently than I normally do. I'm going to start this morning with a story. And so, some of you might be able to relate to this story. I know when I was in my early 20s, it was my father-in-law that was experiencing this. And, and now that I'm not in my early 20s anymore, I get to share in the experience. Um, there's come a point in my life where I, I spend a lot of my time working. Um, I do a bunch of different jobs, trying to get things accomplished, trying to get things done, trying to make money so that I pay the bills, trying, trying to do everything that most people in life are doing. The only difference is, for some, we spend more time doing it than we spend rejuvenating ourselves. And so this has become my experience. When I sit down, it's like going to a doctor's office and wait in the doctor's office, I have a tendency to fall asleep. And I can remember taking my youngest daughter to the doctor's office, her doctor's office, and we were sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting, and all of a sudden I got an elbow. Apparently, I had started snoring in the waiting room. I can also remember a time in my younger years where I tried to stay awake more hours than a normal person should. And in those occasions, my loving friends like to play practical jokes on me. I can remember falling asleep at one point, and some of my friends happened to be around, and, and when I woke up, I was out on the front lawn in my briefs. As they laughed for months, they continually reminded me not to fall asleep in their presence again. With that said, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together to hear your word, the promises, the teachings that you have given us, to spend time in them, to hear them, to let them soak into our souls, those words, those promises. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as a body of believers and, and share in our life experiences the good and the bad to encourage one another, to be close, even if not physically, to be close at heart. Lord God, take this time this morning and prepare each heart to receive what you have for them. Lord God, this particular message this morning has a lot in it, and I believe that each person has a peace that they've been waiting for and longing for. So prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us, each one of us. And Lord God, lead us to you, making us stronger and more hungry for what you have planned in our futures, our futures on this planet and our futures in eternity. Lord God, draw us to you. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, I ask this and thank you. Amen. Now this is where I usually start the morning. Good morning and welcome to Solid Rock Church of Bolton Landing, New York. I'm Pastor Bill and I'm happy to have this time to share with you today. Today's message revolves around a teaching of Jesus. A teaching which can be found in multiple books of the Bible a teaching which Jesus informs mankind may just make the difference in your eternal life, in your eternal home. This teaching finds people missing heaven because they close their eyes. Matthew 24, 42 through 44 says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know 
on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. In several places in Scripture, God makes it clear that people will become low through their daily routines, and they will put off till tomorrow a genuine relationship with their Lord and Savior. Jesus teaches us that this is very dangerous because in doing this, there will be people who miss eternity with Him in heaven because they never set their heart on Him as Savior and Lord of their lives. When the day comes where they meet Jesus face to face, They'll be expecting to enter the heaven that they had heard about. But Jesus will say to them plainly, I never knew you. I was never your Lord and Savior. I was never invited into your heart to help turn you from your old sinful ways, the selfish, self-centered ways of the world. You needed to choose me before you died in your sins. But instead, you chose to remain in the ways of the world, playing just a little bit longer, then a little bit longer, until your time ran out. I never wanted this for you, but you chose the ways of the world over me. And that means that you have chosen to be separated from me for eternity. Today, Jesus tells us, do not fall asleep while you're waiting. Don't be fooled into thinking that there is any other way into heaven except to keep your eyes set on Jesus and follow him all the way there. Do not be fooled into thinking that you have plenty more time to dabble in your worldly pleasures before you turn to Jesus. I really struggle with something as a pastor. At every funeral I've been to, and even spoken at, we talk about seeing our loved ones in heaven when we get there. But if Jesus is the only way to get there, which scripture tells us that he is the only way to get there, and even though people say, I'm a good person, or he or she was a good person and will surely be in heaven, no one is good enough to get into heaven on their own. This is stated in God's holy word too. If Jesus is telling the truth when he says that the path and gate into heaven are narrow and only a few find it, then are we doing a good thing by claiming heavenly homes for people who clearly opposed God's design for, for entry into eternity with him? This is my struggle. I'm not the judge who decides who will enter and who will be turned away. Jesus oversees that responsibility. I'm one, just one of many who's been called to tell people what the Word of God says, what it says we should and shouldn't do. That means that even though I may have seen evidence that shows one thing, my heart knows that people need hope. And the truth is, if and when we get to heaven, Scripture tells us that we'll be surprised to see some people in heaven and even more surprised to find that some people we thought were, were going to be there were not allowed in. What does this mean? Well, as pastors and Christians alike, it means that with every soul, we should consider how merciful our Savior is. Did you hear that? With every soul, no matter what we see in their life, we should consider how merciful our Savior is beyond our comprehension. And then proceed with hope that each person took the opportunity, whether we saw it or not, to turn their heart to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The thief on the cross next to Jesus did not say some special prayer on a Sunday morning service. His heart, that was once joining with the rest and hurling insults at Jesus, changed. It changed on that cross. It changed in his dying moments. And in that moment, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus forgave his debts right there in his last moments. 
This is one of the strongest things in my heart to teach people. It's not the special words that you utter. It's the heart that they flow from. Someone with hatred in their heart can stand before an altar and utter a sequence of words not from a repentant heart that wants to change directions, but from a heart of fear that wants to cover its backside if hell is real. This is not the repentant heart that turns and receives Jesus as Lord and Savior, but a heart that wants protection to remain in its ways. Those who receive Jesus receive Him when their heart is repentant. Meaning, I know I was wrong, and I deserve what's coming, but Lord, please forgive me, and help me to change my ways, to line up with yours. Show me the way. I'm ready to follow. Every repentant heart Every repentant heart receives Jesus as Savior and Lord. And it's not just those who remain in hatred that will forfeit heaven. Do you know that in God's holy word, there's there's scripture verses that say that these people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? People with hatred will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. People with unforgiveness in their heart, that they're not willing to let go of. They will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. People who remain in sexually immoral acts and relationships, they will not inherit heaven. Those who continue to steal, those who are greedy, those who submerge themselves in drunkenness, those who talk trash about people, those who deceive people in order to take from them, This is just some of the list that's written in God's holy word that says these people who choose to remain in these actions will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And don't forget those who will be prone to putting their confidence in more than God alone. Those who will surrender to idolatry with every fear and struggle. Do you have any of these things poking its ugly head out of your heart over and over again? or maybe just from time to time. If you do, we're going to pray soon that our hearts will surrender all the hurt, anger, frustration, deceit, and unhealthy control that feeds these things that will keep us out of heaven. Because there's pain in hearts that hold on to these things. And that's why it's so hard to leave them behind and let go of them. Today, God is drawing us to attention. It's no longer safe to coast. The world has always been in a spiral, and we're now entering the point where it begins to speed up. As I was writing this, I was thinking, have you guys ever been to like the mall or or one of the little stores where they have the thing that you drop money into and goes around and around and around, and as it gets closer and closer to the hole in the middle, it begins to speed up? until it's flying so fast that you can't even see it anymore? It's a spiral. The world has always been in a spiral. We are now entering the point where it begins to speed up. Let me rephrase that. The world hasn't always been in a spiral. When God created it, it wasn't in a spiral. But when sin entered the world, the spiral began. The Bible talks about horrific things that are coming in the last days, things that are going to kill millions and millions of people. In these scriptures, we also find a blessing stored for believers, a blessing that will release, will be released at a purposefully hidden time. This blessing is known as the rapture. And as church people or people who have been in church for a long period of time, we get used to certain terms that that are in God's Word. And so we use them without thinking that some people don't know at all what we're talking about. And so today I want to explain to you a little bit about what the rapture is. The rapture is described in God's Word as a period of time or a period in time when we will see 
Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. There will be a trumpet blast. And people will begin leaving this planet and joining Him in the air. That is the rapture. When Jesus returns to take His holy people off this planet. The reason that this happens is that God's wrath is about to come on the planet. And Jesus is protecting His holy people. For centuries, scholars have searched the scriptures trying to line up all the details so that we'll know step by step the sequence of events. But God has determined, and he states in scripture, that no one will know for sure. And so we have world-renowned scholars that compile differing sequences because no one will know for sure. This is why we must seek God's word first, then hear the opinions of man. Because if these scholars who are devoting their lives to searching scripture are coming up with with differing ideas of something that God said wasn't for man to know, then we can either buy into what this one's saying or that one's saying or this one's saying, or we can read God's word and see what parts he does want man to know and live our lives according to what God says. When I first began, well, a little bit before I even began going to ministry school, when I first began searching God's Word, I felt like God's Word was too difficult for me to read. There was too much in it. There was too many words that I didn't understand. And so I would set the Bible aside And I would turn to a book that said, this is what I was going to learn from that book. And okay, I wanted to learn that, so I would read that book instead of God's Word. And about halfway through the first book, I felt this impression in my heart that I was doing something wrong. And I didn't really understand everything about God yet. I still don't understand everything about God, but... I didn't understand about him speaking to me and and what this feeling was that I was going through. And eventually, through some people in the church that I was attending at the time, I realized that God was speaking to my heart about what I was doing. I wasn't searching his word. I was searching someone else's word. I was searching someone else's opinion on God's word. And I wasn't leaving room for the Holy Spirit to speak to me directly about whatever I was searching for. I say this all the time, and some of you have heard this story before, that it's vitally important to our spiritual health that we spend time in God's Word. Because if all we ever do is go to church and listen to the pastor speak, All we'll ever get is his opinion of what God's word says. If all we ever do is pick up a book from someone's nightstand or from the bookstore and search for what someone says God's word says, then all we're going to get is a man's opinion of what God wants to speak to us. But when you pick up God's word and you start reading it, the Holy Spirit will start illuminating parts of God's Word that will stand out to you. And the living Word of God will begin to speak to you in ways that you never imagined possible. It's waiting in God's Word, not man's Word. The scholar who wrote several of the books used in the ministry school that I went to shared a brief thought before he began unwrapping these portions of Scripture that we're going to talk about. In his younger years, he and all those around him rejoiced in the teaching that Christians would escape the wrath of God on this world through the rapture. They didn't understand the intricacies of how it was going to happen or what was going to be involved in it, but they rejoiced anyways because they would be spared the coming atrocities. Basically what he's saying is someone told them that they weren't going to have to go through these things. And so... They just accepted it. 
No reading God's Word. No, no searching out. How is this going to happen? What does God want from people? How is, how is some people going to get through it and other people not going to get through it? They just accepted it. This is how it's going to happen. And I believe I'm a Christian, so that means I don't get to, I don't have to go through the wrath of God. It wasn't until much later that he began digging in the full hermeneutics, hermeneutics of the Bible found and found the scriptures that give him this assurance. And so we're going to look at some of these scriptures today. And I'm going to try to be quick so that we don't go way over today. Our first scripture is Mark 13, 24 through 27. Mark 13, 24 through 27. It says, But in those days after the suffering and distress of, the tribu- of that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will, give it, will not give its light. The stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, in royal majesty and splendor. And then he will send out the angels and will gather together his elect, those he has chosen for himself from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Okay. So what did I just read? After the tribulation. After the tribulation, Jesus will come. Does that not say that Christians will still be on the planet? Will still be in this world? when all these bad things that we hear about in the tribulation are going to take place? Does that mean that we're all going to be here to experience these terrible times? Let's try another one. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not provide its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And at that time, the sign of the Son of Man coming in his glory will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth and especially Israel will mourn, regretting their rebellion and rejection of the Messiah. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and brilliance, and splendor. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, God's chosen ones, from the four winds, from the end of the heavens to the other. Again, after the tribulation, Jesus comes on the clouds for his people. Why is it important for us to read Scripture? Try another one. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 5, 11. I purposely did not mark my Bible this week so that I could find these faster. So it gave you time to find them in your own Bible to make sure that what you're hearing this morning is what your Bible says too. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 5, 11. Now we do not want you to be uninformed believers about those who are asleep in death so that you will not grieve for them as the others do who have no hope beyond this present life. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as in fact he did, even so God in this same way, by raising them from the dead, will bring him those believers, bring with him those believers who have fallen asleep in Jesus. What is he saying? He's saying that the, the dead will rise first when Jesus comes on the cloud. And they will be with Jesus in the air. And then the living on the planet at that time that are his followers will rise up to be with them. For we say this to you by the Lord's own word, 
that we who are still alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will in no way proceed into his presence those believers who have fallen asleep in death. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the archangel and with the blast of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain on earth will simultaneously be caught up, raptured together with them, the resurrected ones, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another with these words concerning our reunion with believers who have died. Now as to the times and dates, brothers and sisters, you have no need for anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the return of the Lord is coming just as a thief comes unexpectedly and suddenly in the night. While they are still saying peace and safety, all is well and secure. Then in a moment, unforeseen, destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains on a woman with child. And they will absolutely not escape, for there will be no way to escape the judgment of the Lord. But you believers... All you who believe in Christ as Savior and acknowledge him as God's Son are not in spiritual darkness, nor held by its power, that the day of judgment would overtake you by surprise like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We do not belong to the night nor to darkness. So then let us not sleep in spiritual indifference as the rest of the world does, but let us keep wide awake, alert and cautious, and let us be sober self-controlled, calm, and wise. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we believers belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope and confident assurance of salvation. For God has not destined us to incur his wrath. God has not destined us to incur his wrath. That is, he did not select us to condemn us, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died willingly for us, so that whether we are alike, awake, alive, or asleep, dead, as Christ, at Christ's appearing, we will live together with him, sharing eternal life. Therefore, encourage and comfort one another and build up one another, just as you were doing. Scripture informs us in verses 8, 9, and 10 that Jesus died willingly for us. And in our salvation, we find that through Jesus, we are spared from the wrath of God. Through Jesus, we will be spared the wrath of God. God's word tells us that all scripture is true. With that said, sometimes we need the help of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to how God's Word interweaves itself. This is what I mean. I just read you two scriptures that said that Christians will still be on this planet when the Great Tribulation happens. But then I read you a third scripture that says that we will be spared the wrath of God. We will be spared the Great Tribulation. So now how does this play together? In the Assemblies of God, which this church is an Assemblies of God church, and the school that I went to is, is an Assemblies of God school, we believe that this statement in Scripture is pivotal. Verse 9 says, For God has not destined us to incur his wrath. That is, he did not select us to condemn us, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus we will be spared the coming wrath of God. Another scripture, Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value. 
for you died to this world, and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death and deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body with its sensational self-centered instincts, immorality, impurity, sinful passions, evil desires, and greed, which is a kind of idolatry because it replaces your devotion to God. Because of these sinful things, the divine wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Let me read that again. Because of these sinful things, the divine wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Those who fail to listen and who routinely and obstinately disregard God's precepts, his teachings. And in these sinful things, you also once walked when you were habitually living in them without the knowledge of Christ. But now, rid yourself completely of all these things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and obscene, abusive, filthy, vulgar language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, for you have stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new spiritual self who is being continually renewed in true knowledge in the image of him who created the new self. This scripture also tells us that when Jesus appears in glory, those called by his name, Christians, will also appear with him in glory. And it also states that because of sin, because of sin, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Those who routinely and obstinately disregard God's precepts, his teachings and commands. Who is his wrath coming on? Not the whole world. His wrath is coming on all those who disregard him. It states that believers will be raised up with Jesus in the air in his glory and that the wrath of God will be upon the disobedient. Again, all scripture is true. So what could So what could we need more help seeing? Another one. We're getting close to the end. Revelations 3:10. Revelations 3:10 which says, because you have kept my word of my endurance, my command to persevere, I will keep you safe from the hour of trial, that hour which is about to come on the whole inhabited world to test those who live on the earth. Because you have kept my word, my endurance, the command to persevere, I will keep you safe from the hour of trial. Is the third time the charm. Jesus claims to various levels of believers the blessings and judgments that he has over their way of conducting themselves. In this verse, he states that because these people have kept his command to persevere in spite of all that came against them while they were on this planet, because they held tight to him, he will protect them from the great tribulation that's coming on the world. All those who hold tightly to Jesus, no matter how ugly mankind makes life, did you catch that? No matter how ugly mankind makes life, will be spared going through the great tribulation, which is the wrath of God. Now let me stir things a little bit more. I think this is our last scripture verse. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. It says, Now in regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to meet him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly unsettled or alarmed either by a so-called prophetic revelation or a a spirit or a message or a letter alleged to be from us to effect to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come. The day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That is the great rebellion, the abandonment of faith by professed Christians, 
and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and so insolently above every so-called God and object of worship so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Scripture, very plainly, says that Jesus will not be coming on the clouds until these things happen. Are you confused? This is how the scholar I mentioned earlier ties all these verses together. One, the wrath of man is not comparable to the wrath of God. The wrath of man, the terrible times that we're going to experience in our lives on this planet because of mankind is not even comparable to the wrath of God that's coming on this planet. This means that terrible times are upon us and they will get much worse. Christians will be present during these times when mankind makes life awful for all believers. But when Jesus comes to take his people off this planet, then all who remain will experience the wrath of God. No one will be able to hide from the destruction that he has planned to unleash on the world. What Christians went through at the hands of evil men will not even come close to what those people who remain on this planet will experience under the wrath of God. Two, translating the original writings of Scripture into current language gives way to interpretation. The original writings contained words that didn't carry through into our current day and language. They also contain words that, that hold different meanings today than they did back then. With this said, the forums that gathered to assemble each of the versions of our Bible today work together to explain as close as possible what's being said. The, the scholars searched, did research of the wording used, wait, before I even go to that, this morning when I came in, somebody shared with me that they had gotten a new Bible. And ironically, not really ironically, it's actually builds me up many times to see God move in such a way that nobody else knows what's going on, but, but I knew that this part was going to be in here today, and, and God gave me a little nudge. This new Bible that this person has, has four translations compared side by side so that as this person's reading through Scripture, they can see what this version says and what this version says and what this version says and what this version says. And they can see the differences between how the different groups of people that gathered together and put together a version of the Bible based on what they believe the original writings say saw what the original writings say. And so I said to that person, it will be interesting to see how how this version and this version line up at different points and at different points say what seems to be completely different things. But the whole basis of the Bible, the whole basis of the Bible is this, that God so loved the world and knew that mankind on their own was not going to be able to make it to him, that he sent his only son to pay our debt so that we could make it to him. So every other word that's been translated in our current Bible that may not line up with what's been translated in another Bible is not as important as that message. So no matter what you see as you're reading through Scripture, remember that the most important part, the most important part for God is that you're going to be with him in heaven. That's what he's calling you to. The scholars, or the scholar that I talked about, researched the words that were used in the gospel that we started reading today. That said that Christians would still be here. The after and the next, or then. He researched the words in the original translations to find out what was actually wrote in those places. And this is how he explained it. 
The list of events in our writing and language hold the understanding of a sequence, while the original wording did not imply an order of steps, but a simple list of things that will be seen in that time. During translation, the words chosen to be closest to the text have now offered opportunity for hermeneutical error by giving added strength to certain words that weren't there in the original text. Basically, if we're not engaging in all of God's word, then we may easily slip into a wrong teaching. Basically, what he said is when, when he read through the original writings, the scrolls, when he went and sought them out and searched for the wording, he discovered that it was a list, not an order of a steps. For those of you who dig into God's word, I pray that God has your wheels turning this morning. And whether you followed this journey or jumped off along the way, I pray that you don't get stuck in the nuances of the wording, missing the big picture. What's the big picture? God wants you in heaven with him. Every repentant heart that turns to Jesus as Lord and Savior has been redeemed from the hell that it deserved. For the rest of us, here is the points behind this message this morning. Last two pages. One, you absolutely have to open God's word and soak it in, or you will miss many treasures that God does want you to have during your trek through life. What does that mean? If, if I had read the first two um, verses that I had shared with you from the Gospels, I would have assumed that, that we are going to be on this planet when everything goes crazy and people are dying by the millions. But by continuing to search through God's Word, I see where God's Word says that Christians, people who have set their heart on Jesus and held tight to Him no matter what happened in this world and no matter what came against them, they will be spared the coming wrath of God. If I hadn't continued to search through Scripture, looking for these other verses that assure us that we will not be here for the great tribulation. We will be here for the tribulation of man, the terrible times that mankind will cause, but not the tribulation of God. Two, Christians are, in fact, going to experience some of the awful things listed in Scripture for the end times, like persecution of the Christians to renounce their faith. What does that mean? It means that we are going to experience this world when it starts telling us that we cannot worship God anymore. We are going to experience the times when mankind is so mad and angry and frustrated that Christians are worshiping a God that that they see as, as a bad person or whatever, that they are going to start killing Christians because they're Christians. We are going to see those times. And in fact, there's people around us in this world that are seeing those times already. Christians with a sandy foundation will walk away from God when pressures of the world crash against them. Again, I'm using words from the Bible, and if you've spent time in the Bible, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you haven't spent time in the Bible or you haven't read this particular passage, you have no clue what I'm talking about. And in this, God says, Jesus actually says that, that we need a firm foundation built on solid rock. And if our foundation, the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our hope for our eternal future... If our foundation is built on anything that will shift and move around, as soon as the waves start crashing against us, as soon as the things of this world start beating us down, as soon as people start dying that we love and we don't want them to, to be separated from us, as soon as our, our homes start getting destroyed or taken away, as soon as our jobs go away and our finances start to crumble, as soon as the world starts crashing against us, we will turn away from God. Because we're not standing on a firm foundation. We're standing on a belief that God is going to protect us from all that. And when it doesn't happen, we get angry and we walk away. A firm foundation that God's plan for us doesn't 
isn't only limited to this planet. God's plan for us involves eternity, and He's going to walk us to it, no matter what we face in this planet. Three, Christians are going to be separated from the wrath of God, or spared from the wrath of God, and will be caught up into the air with Jesus before God's wrath is released. Did you catch that? It's very important, so that I didn't confuse anybody. Christians are going to be spared from the wrath of God and will be caught up into the air with Jesus before God's wrath is released. For if you are holding on to things in your heart that are preventing you from surrendering completely to Jesus, it's time to release your grip. It's time to release your grip. Not only are your days numbered, but the days of the world are also counting down. I don't want to stand up here and say it's the end of times. But I am going to stand up here and say the world is getting crazier and crazier by the minute. And things that we never thought we'd see in our lifetime are beginning to be talked about. And the world is really getting crazy. Don't meet Jesus face to face while you're still holding on to one of these things that will prevent you from inheriting the kingdom of God. We do have a merciful God. We do have a merciful God. But he also holds without wavering to his word when he says that these people will not enter. You can count it as fact. The people who remain in the things that God wrote in his holy word, saying these people will not enter heaven. They will not enter heaven. But here's the good news. He's ready to work with you today. He loves you and wants to heal the parts of you, the parts of your heart that are causing you to hold on to unforgiveness, hatred, deceit, sexual immoral relationships and actions, stealing and slandering. If you have any of these things hiding in your heart, don't be fooled into thinking that you can slide by Jesus at the gates of heaven. He sees what's in your heart. He knows it's there, and he's calling you to do something about it today. He's calling you to trust him with your pain. All of these things listed get stuck in hearts because of pain. He's calling you to trust him with your pain. Everything that separates us from God stems from a lack of trust in him and a fear of pain. What you'll receive from him when you surrender all of your heart is healing and the confidence that his plan for you leads to a a happiness that you can't even fathom yet. Would you all bow your heads and pray with me today? Some of us need a whole lot of community praying for the darkness that's been wedged into our hearts today. As we pray this morning, I ask you to quietly, quietly add the names of each person that enters your thoughts throughout this prayer. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Don't forget to add yourself if you're prompted by the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we come before you this morning We thank you, Lord Jesus, for for making the way for us to, to come to the throne of God. To come to the mercy seat. To come and ask for forgiveness. To come and ask for help. To come and surrender what's been wedged into our hearts. Lord God, I ask you in these next few moments to reveal to our hearts, reveal to each one of us, if these things that you promise will keep people out of heaven are present in us. Lord God, speak to our hearts and help us to turn. Lord God, I pray for the pain that causes these things, the hurt, 
the distrust that happens when, when things attack us, when people let us down, when people around us do awful things that hurt us for years and years and years. Lord God, I ask for healing of the fear and the hatred that comes into our hearts when, when these things happen in our lives. The fear and the hatred that cement that pain and keep it lurking in our hearts. Lord God, I pray for for the Christians who will experience the times of tribulation at the hands of man. We see in your holy word that these times are, are going to be very scary. And for many, very painful. We see that in these times, people are going to turn from you. People with a, a weak faith people who haven't spent time in your word or, or building a foundation with you. When these times start crashing against them, they're going to turn and walk away, not realizing that your plan is much greater than what we experience on this planet. Lord God, I pray for our children who, who have been affected by, by the teachings of this world, by the things that they see just by being present in this world. We pray for our children who may experience your wrath. Because their hearts aren't turning. Lord God, show us everything that we can do, everything that we can say, whatever, whatever, to protect one more from the wrath that's coming on this planet. Please lead us to it. Lord God, I don't want to I don't want to release everyone this morning until everyone's had the opportunity to speak to you in their heart about the pain, about the suffering, about the anger, about the hatred, about the distrust Whatever else has entered our hearts through things that have happened in our lives. Lord God, guide each one of us. Reveal to us how to walk with you and release those things. To leave them behind once and for all, never going back again to pick them up release them and move forward in full confidence and trust in who you are, how trustworthy you are, and how much confidence we can have that you will not let us down when it comes to our big picture, the big picture that you want to spend eternity with us in heaven. Lord God, there's so many things in your word that, that explain why evil things are happening in this world. Help us, Lord God, to release the things that have happened to us so that we can see all that you have for us. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, I ask this and thank you. Amen. Our service for today is concluded. I thank you all for joining us and
And I hope and pray that at least one nugget was given to each person in this message today. May God bless you all.